Hello, 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 and welcome in this new episode of Awakening Stories. Today, we have Megan with us. Megan is a channel, a coach, and a mentor for embodied leadership. She helps you step into your power with confidence and lead with your soul. I cannot wait for this episode because it's going to be so juicy, so let's just dive right in. So, Megan, I'm so excited to have this chat with you, and I think we're going to go straight in, and I'm going to ask you about spiritual awakenings and what it is for you, what it means for you. Spiritual awakening to me is returning to your soul. In my experience, it was waking up to the systems in the beliefs that I was in and being aware how unconscious I was in it, playing by other people's beliefs, what society to, tells you to do, like get a good job, go to school and following the typical path. And then questioning, is that what I really want? And asking your soul, okay, if that's not what I want, what do I really want? And it's all listening within because each of our journeys are so unique beautiful and do you think that it's harder for some people because we have more resistance towards figuring all of that out or just it depends on the person i think everyone's journey is unique I think some people when they awaken to it they are so done and they're ready to go ready to release and really figure out their path I think for others they get really comfortable because it's it's safe you know being in the matrix having these beliefs it's all planned out for you and that's really comfortable it's not easy questioning everything releasing what doesn't serve you and then making a new path it's it's not easy so it all depends on the person and their journey how did that happen for you I know you were a teacher before that yeah awakening yes. so can you tell us more about that yeah so um with my spiritual awakening, I was teaching and online I started to see some beautiful psychics and intuitives just give these beautiful readings and messages. And I was like, I want to do that. They're helping people. It helps me so much. And I wanted to tap back into my gifts. When we're kids, we're all very tapped in, but I remember really deeply as a child, I remember seeing spirits, especially dead people. I would see them all the time. And I had a hard time going to sleep because I didn't quite understand it. And my parents weren't very spiritual, so they couldn't guide me through that. So when I was in middle school, I shut off my gifts because I was just terrified of seeing dead people and I would see them outside of my mind's eye like I could see the outline of the spirit and it was actually when I saw my great grandmother who passed at my grandma's home I saw her so clearly and it scared the living shit out of me and I said okay I'm done <laughs> no more so I declared I said I don't want to see anything anymore but then it wasn't until I was an adult years and years later that I saw people actually helping others with their gifts and it wasn't scary and they were very empowered in their boundaries and it was a beautiful thing to be able to see spirits, to be able to channel messages. So I joined a class to learn about my spiritual gifts and develop them. And then at the time I was in teaching and I just so badly wanted to develop my gifts as quick as possible because I just wanted to get out of there. But that takes time and patience and practice. And shortly after I was learning about it, I was practicing. That's when I had my first dark night of the soul slash like deeper spiritual awakening. So what happened during that dark night of the soul for you? I, I just awakened, I already knew I didn't want to teach. 
again, I followed everything everyone said, especially Mm -hmm. my parents of, you know, you go to university, you get a good job. And I had wanted to be a teacher my whole life. And then I got to teacher's college to study and it felt so off. And everyone just kept saying, you know, just, just wait till you have your own class. It'll be great. And so I kept waiting. So I had my own class and it didn't get better. And they're like, okay, wait till you're a couple years in, you'll feel more comfortable. I waited and I didn't. And so I had a really hard time teaching. It's not a good system. It's a very broken system that, again, it's based on having children just, you know, follow what what the government says. And you have to be a good student. You have to be a good worker. So it's very based in conditioning. And it's not based on actually helping children. It's just pushing them along. And so I was like, I'm here to help kids, but I can't help kids in this system. I'm one person. I had like typically 35 kids in a class. There are all these different levels. I usually taught kids around like age 10, but there'd be so many different levels, like kids at kindergarten level, but they're 10 years old. And so I'm like, how do I spread myself thin all these ways? So I really awoke into, I don't know if I can help them because I'm one person in this larger system. And it really affected my mental health. And I would go home and I would be worrying about these kids till four o'clock in the morning of how am I going to help them? How am I going to help them? And that's no way to live. And it ended up catching up to me. And there was a lot of things in the classroom that affected me. Um, Even my physical safety sometimes was at risk because of the deep troubles that these kids had. And that was another layer where I didn't feel safe. So it had all built up and I kind of just had enough. And I had gone on leave and it was only my second year of teaching. And I I felt like a failure. I said, I work towards this my whole life. I'm here. So many people, and it wasn't easy to get teaching jobs. I got a teaching job right away. Everything was easy for me in that sense. I should be grateful. So many people want to be a teacher. I'm here. I can deal with it. How come I'm already broken down and I just barely started. I made myself out to be a failure because I wasn't adhering to that system. I wasn't thriving in that system. I couldn't handle it. So it got to a point where I just couldn't go to work anymore. And I had about like a three month leave. And when I was finally out of that environment, my nervous system just like crashed because every day I was on fumes, fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. And that's what kept me going. But then I had this time to kind of rest and digest it all. And it was a lot. And I tried healing. And then I also made myself wrong for that of like, okay, now I'm tapped into my abilities a little bit. How come I can't heal? How come I'm not magically healed from all that trauma, all these years? How come I'm not magically healed? And I made myself wrong for that. And I had to, part of the process when you go on leave is like, you have to go to your doctor, you have to see a psychologist and all of that. And that system just felt really wrong to me as well. Cause I had my doctor pushing, like you need to be on medication for your anxiety and depression. And then I was seeing a psychotherapist and it was like repeating the same stories over and over. And she would give me insights, but I was like, I already know that. (laughs) Like, you're not telling me anything new. It was stuff I was already working on and healing. So then I had another awakening within that of like these systems, they're not made for people to heal. It's to keep you stuck, to keep you like a zombie on medications and to keep you re-traumatized, just talking about the same thing over and over. But at that point, I felt like nothing was working and I wasn't making any progress until I decided, you know what, right now I have to be checking in with them but I want to do this my own way. And so I was trying things. I was making a little bit of progress, but then my intuition came in so clearly and said Reiki. And I was like, okay, I've heard about Reiki before, but I didn't know much about Reiki. 
I went online, I searched Reiki classes. I had a woman teaching 10 minutes away from me. I took the course and I, it was such an intense detox because I had so much trauma held within my body and I got super sick. And afterwards I felt like a new person. It was things that were on my mind on repeat and these burdens that I felt like I couldn't heal. I had a new perspective towards it and I energetically felt lighter. And then that's kind of what took me into my new part of my journey and gave me a new perspective and helped me develop my gifts, get more confident and also be confident in, I don't belong in the system and that's okay. I didn't make myself wrong anymore of, you know, the system, the system isn't actually built for people to thrive. And so it's okay if I don't thrive in it. And yeah, it's the overview of my first little spiritual awakening in dark night of the soul. Yeah. What kind of gifts did you activate first? What kind of gifts did I activate first? Um, I would say tapping into energy and the chakras because of the Reiki portion. And one of my gifts that's always been strong is beliefs, is hearing the subconscious beliefs that would be held onto the body and helping release them. And then from there, I developed my intuitive abilities more and went into more channeling to tell them, okay, this is the belief that you're holding on to. Let's clear and then channel guidance of here's how you can move forward with your embodiment in action to not hold on to that belief anymore. We're going to embody your higher belief and, you know, move on with life because sometimes they can get stuck in those cycles because that's the belief you've held on to your whole life or past lifetimes. Beautiful. And did you ever get your clairvoyance back? So clairaudience was my first gift. And I really, really, really wanted to be clairvoyant. And that came naturally over time. And even now, my clairs have shifted a lot. I think it just depends and it grows with time. But my challenge with um, clairaudience was I doubted a lot in question, like which one's my mind and which Mm -hmm. one is my intuition. And I find that's usually a challenge for people who are mainly clairaudient. They have a hard time deciphering, okay, what's my ego mind and what's my soul or if I'm channeling. Yeah, that's that's true. And it's, I believe, because it's the same voice often for us. So... Right, I would it explain like it. Your voice. Yeah. And do you see dead people again or not? Because in the beginning you mentioned you were seeing seeing dead people. Yeah. So I do. Um it's not something I've actively been trying to redevelop. Hmm. I thought as I was like developing my gifts, that would be the first one that was the strongest because that's what I saw my whole life. But it was more so the clear audience, the energy healing, the shifting beliefs. So when I'm out, I'll I'll see spirit all the time and I'll just I'll tell it to go to the light. <laughs> I'm like in my house and I'm cooking and I'm like, okay, you gotta go. <laughs> I don't want you here. But honestly, connecting mediumship, that's not something I've I've actively tried to tap into. Sometimes it naturally comes in, like when I'm in in sessions, but yeah, not actively. Yeah, that's what I was about. That is what I was about to say. Maybe it wasn't meant for you to be a medium and see all those spirits. It was a I way for you that. to connect to deeper things. I think for me, it was a gateway and a remembrance of like, you have these gifts and they're strong. And um, also your clairvoyance, like trust that your clairvoyance is going to come because that was my, my gift when I was a child. And so I think it was just, yeah, trust that your clairvoyance is coming. And, you know, if dead people come up, they come up, but (laughs) 
got my focus. Of course. Um, did the class that you took help you a lot with those gifts and for sure I had an incredible teacher and it helped me tap into so many gifts so we did body intuition we did mediumship we did uh, angel readings channeling automatic writing so we got a taste test of everything and then we were encouraged to tap into what really called us but I think what was most important is ethics of reading people Because I think <clears throat> that's something I talk about a lot because I'm really passionate about it because on social media, I see people really lack ethics and boundaries. So I was really lucky to have a teacher where that was the first thing she taught of here are ethics, here are boundaries, not only for reading others, but also for yourself. Because when I entered it, I was still a little bit scared because of my past experiences But she really taught me, you are in control. It doesn't matter what you see, what you feel. You ultimately have the free will and the power. And then she taught us how to ghost bust um, right away. And so when I was seeing spirits all the time, I'd be like, hey, gotta go. You gotta go. And you gotta go <laughs> to keep my space clear. And then I felt more comfortable. And then I felt really empowered. And then that I passed on to, to others as well of, they didn't feel in control of like, okay, I see this, I sense it, I feel it. And helping teach others too, you're in control always, protecting yourself, sending them to the light. So I was really, really fortunate to have an incredible teacher from the start. It's beautiful that you get all this control and power within you right away because we often doubt and I remember once in a group we are both in I talked about I think it's around Halloween in October like something like this where um, spirits come to me and I hear things clairaudiently when I sleep and it's never so fun because I value my sleep a lot and I remember you told me tell them to go away it's your sleep they'll contact you at another time And yeah. it was really empowering to be like, oh, yeah, I get to decide if I want to be disturbed in my sleep or not. Exactly. We always get to decide. And it helped me so much because when I was a kid, I never felt in control. I remember seeing like dark spirits when I was a kid and I and I had a hard time going to sleep and having that knowledge of I decide who's in my space. I decide when they contact me, how they can contact me. I'm in charge and they, you know, get to, like, they're blessed to be in my space, not the other way around. And you always get to decide. Beautiful. And I think it's a beautiful lesson for everyone to remember that. Sometimes we tend to forget. Um, so did you have any other Dark Knight of the Soul and Awakening? I honestly, last September, um, I was off Instagram for a while. I wanted to take time to develop my products, but then it ended up, I ended up getting sick with uh, Miss Rona and that really activated like the deepest of trauma within me towards my body. Because ever since I was a very little girl, I had issues with like body image eating, all kind of disordered behaviors. And I felt like I healed layers mm. of that, but there was still so much trauma stored within my body. And that kind of came up. It was like, whether you like it or not, this is it. We got to deal with it. And so it was a lot to deal with at once. And when I released that, it shifted so much in my life I had lost quite a bit of weight and people were like what are you doing for weight loss and it was I nothing mm. it was just I was holding on to so much trauma that my body was inflamed last year I was the heaviest weight ever but as I really sat trauma that like the weight it was energetic it naturally came off but not even the the way I physically looked how I felt about myself And it really awakened me to, there were some teachers 
um, I was learning from, and it was a bit of like spiritual bypassing. And this kind of made me see like, okay, like you can't bypass anything. And it connected me to the power of your nervous system and how powerful it is to be connected to your nervous system and just to know the process of your nervous system. How do you feel in each state and how to bring yourself back into that home state of connected, calm, and regulated. And so at that time, I, again, my previous distrust for like professional and in therapy, I said, I want to learn myself and get a certification and guide myself through it. And this is such a powerful experience for myself. Then I can help others with similar things. And so I got a somatic trauma therapy certification. And so I just learned about how we store energy in the body and somatic exercises to move that energy out and be really mindful of our nervous system. And that's been such an important layer of healing for me because it's really grounded in the body, like the spiritual healing and the shadow work. That's really beautiful, but that's one part. Mm -hmm. Having also grounded healing of moving the body, tapping into these areas, moving out, being really mindful of how our body naturally works is so beautiful because we can be really hard on ourselves of, oh, I've already healed that. How come it's coming back again? It's, well, no, your nervous system is imprinted in that way because it's been years and years and years of that same story, that same trauma, that same belief. So that was my second really big dark night of the soul, which has been really, really beautiful because it's tied in my work of a body, mind, and spirit approach. And I feel like it's more grounded. It's spirituality, but it's also the raw humanness, which is what we came here for, the human yeah. experience and the spiritual experience. And it's more holistic. It touches on every part of us. So it's beautiful. And I think I skipped ahead a little bit because uh, you were telling us how you were a teacher, but what happened when the leave uh, ended? So it was in 2020 and it was during the time I was already so sick and tired of the system and then everything was coming up with like the mandates and online school and that was something I firmly do not believe in especially children when they're very young they're very impressionable and I was so angry of even more of this fear and being pumped into them and how they were being guided and what they're being guided to believe. And so I felt my mental health again decline and it felt like too much. And I had contacted, like teaching is unionized. So I went to the union. I said, hey, I want to quit. And they were like, are you sure? No, <laughs> you're an incredible teacher. We need you. And well, there's not many teachers like you because, you know, there are a lot of teachers that don't care. I cared. I put in a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of love. And they're like, you know, give it some time, like wait a couple months, like, you know, go back to your doctor and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm not fucking doing that again. Like, I just, I knew it. And so I went on leave again for 30 days. I said, go on leave, decide. They said, take as much time as you need. And so it was 30 days. And then they were like, you know, I think you should take some more time, take some more leave. And I'm like, I'm not doing this fucking paperwork and having to go to my doctor, see all these people. I said, nothing's wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. There's something mm -hmm. wrong with the system that I'm in. I don't belong here. And so you know, my ego was like, you know, you could like stay longer and still get paid and all this stuff. But I was like, I don't want to be paid by them. I want to cut ties. I'm done with the system. I'm done with going through all these steps, all these loops. I said, I'm done. And I quit. And it wasn't even halfway through the year. And I obviously felt terrible for my class. I felt like I felt really upset because you get attached to these kids really quickly. But I was like, you know, I know that there's going to be a teacher there that 
actually wants to be there and will also be great. I said like, God, I trust that whoever replaces Mm -hmm. me will also have a kind heart, a kind soul and have their best interests. And they did. And it was all okay. So I just kind of up and left and then just went full force in my business and focused on that because I knew that was what I was meant to do and focus on. What were you you doing? Uh, What were you offering at the time? At the time I was doing angelic readings, um, one-to-one sessions, a lot of belief work. That's what I was focused on. And also mentorship, helping people get clear on their gifts because that was such an important part of my journey. I always believe, you know, people put a lot of importance and pressure on what is my purpose? What is my purpose? But an easy way to see is, what was a huge transformation in your life that you went through, you healed, and now you feel really confident and embodied in, and you help others through that. So I've gone through this whole process of awakening of, I don't belong in the system, healing that, releasing that, getting out of the matrix, and then developing my gifts. And that was, that completely changed the trajectory of my life. And so I was like, I want to help people with that as well. And so I had a one-to-one mentorship of helping people really get clear on like, okay, what, what are your beliefs? What's running in your subconscious? Do you really believe that? Does it make you happy? And what are your gifts? And I would help them deepen, develop their psychic gifts, intuitive abilities. Beautiful. And do you still do that now? Or have you, well, I know you've evolved, but how did you evolve? So I evolved kind of naturally. And again, like the pressure of we're constantly releasing and healing and transforming. I don't believe that your purpose is one thing. And you're like, okay, this is it. This is my ticket for the rest of my life. So as I was naturally growing and evolving, I noticed that the type of people who are coming to me that wanted to work with me, they already knew their purpose. So that's what kind of shifted for me of it wasn't people coming of like, I'm really scared. I don't know what to do. What is my purpose of this is my purpose. It's just that I want to work on my confidence, my voice Mm -hmm. and my methodology. And so the women that come to me, they're incredible beings of they know their gifts. They're trained in modalities and they kind of have their own way of doing things. And now I just assist them and creating their own methodology. And even with that, they're like, okay, who am I to have my own methodology of healing? It's like, who are you not to? You're so unique. And that helps them be more confident in their offerings. And then we really refine their message and their impact that they want to make on the world. And so it's a process of just natural release embodiment and coming into a deeper confidence and power in their gifts and how they serve the world and also themselves. Beautiful. And do you have an advice to build up trust and confidence in your gifts? Because that's a big part of awakening when we deepen our gifts. For sure. I would say take out the need. And that's the hardest part. Because I remember in my journey, I was at a job I hated. I really just wanted to be psychic, intuitive and help others but I put so much need on it and importance on it. And when you put that, you're coming from ego. You're not coming from your spirit, your higher self, your soul. So my advice would to be to really hold the truth that it's inevitable. Your gifts, serving others, it's inevitable. If it's on your heart, it's going to happen. So when you take out the need of when it needs to happen, what it needs to look like, a timeline, expectations, and all of that, you can surrender more. And then you're listening within from your soul, not from your mind. Because creating from your mind and creating from your soul on your path are two completely different things. And then along with that, I would say consistent practice. For me, it's breath work and meditation. Breath work really helps you release any trauma, stuck emotions within the body. And then meditation, it quiets your mind so you can listen to your soul. 
So those two for me were so important in developing my gifts and being confident in offering them to others. Beautiful. So you stepped out of the role of teacher and stepped into the one of a coach. Did you do a training of any kind to kind of prepare yourself or did you come into it naturally? I did. I got certified in transformational coaching and also well-being coaching. And what I really gathered from that was to really be present when people are speaking And my teacher taught me, like, listen like a rock. Because what can tend to happen, what we're conditioned to do is we listen to respond instead of just purely listening. And from that place of pure listening, you come up, your intuition comes up with the most incredible, beautiful questions to guide people. So for me, coaching isn't telling people they have a problem and telling them how to fix it. It's about deeply listening and asking questions so they can guide themselves to the insight because that's so much more powerful when you can ask these powerful questions and they come to the realization and they're like, oh my gosh, I actually know the answers. I just guided myself. And they're so much more likely to apply their own wisdom or take the action steps that they have come up with and that completely changes their life and their path. It's true, it's beautiful. And do you believe it's mandatory to mandatory to train in coaching to do the type of service that you offer? I don't. To me, it's kind of a tricky question. Yeah. There's so many opinions around it. I think at the end of the day, everyone needs a course in basic ethics and how to not re-traumatize someone, how to know as a coach what is in your practice and what is not. At what point do you need to say, hey, this is a little bit deeper and more complex then I can take you and guide you and refer them to somebody else, maybe a certified somatic trauma therapist or EDMR therapy, because, you know, there's some things I I do believe coaches um, can re-traumatize and not really know, especially in the spiritual coaching. It's very like, we're in the present moment. It's okay. The trauma is in the past. And it's like, well, that doesn't really work with someone with complex traumatic issues so yeah I think everyone should have basic ethics Um, I think that as a coach it's really important to be investing in your path and learning from different teachers but also have some time applying it because I think sometimes what I see is okay get this certification learn from this teacher and it's like okay but have you had time to actually integrate it and practice it I think integration practice learning and also taking from your own gifts it makes from like a good cauldron of your own gifts in what you can offer of course and integration is oftentimes forgotten forgotten about when we do training after training and it's so important to do it I want to talk to you about leadership because I think you have some amazing things to say. And I also think that you have that stance. You are in control, you are confident, and you trust yourself a lot. And to me, that exudes leadership. So I would really like to, you know, just let me let let you have the mic and the floor and just share about leadership and how you view it and how we can step more into that especially now yeah and I think leadership really ties into everything that we were talking about to me the grander picture of leadership is building a new world and we live in a time right now where we see everything crumbling So it's really getting clear of, okay, these old systems that don't work are crumbling. And it's up to me to be a leader to get really clear on what do I see for the future for myself, for the others that I work with, and as a larger collective. So getting really clear on that picture. 
of what do I want? What role do I have in building that new world? And then with that, it can feel really scary. It comes up a lot in my work. And with that, it's knowing your gifts, knowing how you serve others in the deep impact. I think when you're actively working with people, you have that feedback of how important you and your work are. And it's just kind of reminding yourself at the end, it's not actually about you. Because we can put so much importance of who's going to judge me? What am I going to look like? And when we're stepping into new levels of embodiment and leadership, it feels really uncomfortable because we've been in our smaller selves for so long. So that's when we stretch ourselves and realize this is who I've always been meant to be. It's who I am at my core. It's my soul. And my soul naturally is a leader. And so it's remembering you know what? People can judge me all they want. They can think I look like this, that, or the other thing, but it's not about me. When you zoom out, we're just like a small little dot in the multiverse. It's about the larger picture of growing with the collective, making and leading a new way outside of the matrix and what we've been conditioned to do. And the more that you can lean into that, embody that along your journey, it just becomes more natural of like, yeah, this is what I'm here to do. My voice is important. Not who am I to claim this with confidence? Who am I not to be? Because there's so many people, even if you don't realize it behind the scenes, who are looking up to you and are waiting for you to be a leader and show a new way because your confidence in your leadership activates something within them. And it has, it's such like a multi-dimensional thing because when you embody that, there's so many other people that it affects and it affects their network. And then, and it just continues to spread. And that's how we create a new world of leaders and systems and ways of beings and beliefs. That is just more beautiful and more connected, more rooted in love and safety and just appreciating and loving each other for our gifts and really seeing each other at a soul level. Beautiful. And what would be interesting to know is like, well, we know we have to share our voice or we are at a point sometimes where we want to, but we don't know what to share. Do you have an advice to finding your voice and getting grounded into that? For sure. I think, again, it's really connecting with your soul because the difference between our mind being in the mental realm and being in our soul, the questions and the feelings are very different. The mind wants to think, what do I do? What do I post? How do I post it? What are people going to think? How do I do this? How do I get to my goal? It's a lot of the what and whys and hows. Your soul doesn't have that. Your soul already knows and trusts in your path. So that's why, again, breath work and meditation, I will die on this hill. It (laughs) is so freaking important because with the breath work, you're clearing, you're helping all that mental chatter clear. So you're getting out of the mind, you're dropping into the body. You're helping your body feel safe, connected. And from there, you can open up to your channel and to your soul. And your soul knows. Your soul always knows. It knows what to say, how to deliver it. And it'll be so unique to you. And that's where it feels more in flow and effortless rather than the thinking and the question. So anytime if you notice that chatter, you know, okay, I'm not with my soul. And you lean onto your practices to get into that flow state and channel. Beautiful. And I can share a little bit of a personal story because I've been wanting to do a podcast for so long. And last year I recorded an episode, like 30 minutes of flow. And 
I questioned everything and I wanted to have like a month of episodes before and what would it be called and you know all the questions from the mind and like not even a month ago I was like okay so I need to share my voice I want to is the podcast still for me can you give me that idea that I need if it's the medium for me to share my voice or not and just half an hour later I had the name for the podcast and I knew what it would be about and I decided to just go with the flow and just not ask questions about that and not hows and rhythms and all of that because it feels kind of irrelevant somehow yeah it's it's not questioning it's just a knowing it's a strong knowing and that comes with time and experience of trusting but it's like the efforting and the trying to make it happen versus the, it's just a being of, you knew the podcast was going to happen. It's been on your heart. And rather than the question, it was like, here it is. Here's the name. Here's what's going to happen. And it just kind of naturally floats from within. So I think that's a really important lesson for yeah. the listeners of, is it coming from soul or is it coming from mind? Cause it gets to be really easy. And do you think we need to learn to trust ourselves with the help of someone else or can we do it alone? Because I've really spent time last year trying to trust myself and I'm not sure that would have happened past this podcast if I did not trust more, leaned into that more. I think for me personally, I think that it's a balance. Mm -hmm. I think that having a teacher who is at a different point in their journey, who have already embodied and gone through something that I'm currently working through within, they can remind me and bring me back. And they have some tools, embodiments, lessons, and experiences that I don't quite have. And just being in their energy, their presence, their knowing that's activating for me and that can shift me back in. But I also believe what we we're talking about before, we can rely too much on others. Mm-hmm. And that's not a recipe for trusting because then you're just, yeah. okay, this teacher and then this, and then we're always other teachers, other mentors. I do believe we need some quiet time to integrate and trust because if you're always relying on others, that muscle needs to be strengthened from within. And I think life naturally gives us those periods of time where it's like, okay, you need to cut all outside sources. It's just you. Yeah. Like with my last awakening, it was like, okay, you need to stop like no more this, no more that outside sources. It's yes, that's helpful, but it's time to get quiet and go from within and that also gives you time to trust your discernment because you shouldn't be taking everything that a teacher or mentor says as okay this is it this is gospel and I've done that before you have that time to be like okay this is what I've learned how does that sit with me in my energy and then you can integrate it when you're asking that question you can trust yourself more and then integrate it and then that kind of makes your own unique experience instead of just okay this is what my teacher said let's follow and trust that so I I really do think that it's a balance I think that teachers can really help our growth exponentially in a shorter amount of time but there's so much value in just shutting out the world minimizing things that your soul says like maybe you want to cut off some friendships altogether or for a while when you have that quiet time you can really reevaluate your life and your path and what you need to trust and what you need to move forward with. Yeah, it's like getting a teacher is a shortcut, but in the end, you will always need the time alone with yourself to 100%. embody what you were taught. 100%. Yeah. So this is a question I really like to ask. What advice would you give yourself, your younger self? going through an awakening or a dark night of the soul? I would say surrender. Because when I was, my first dark night of the soul, 
I place so much importance on the end goal of this is my desires. This is what I want. I want to be an intuitive teacher doing intuitive readings. At the time, that's what I really, really wanted. And I was pushing, forcing to get there, to get there. When again, it's inevitable to get there if that's my desire. So it's how can I surrender this minute, this hour, this day, instead of having my mind of like, okay, I have steps A to Z, how I'm going to get to my desire and I need to push and I need to do this and I need to do that of release the need and just surrender because your soul is the ultimate guidance. When we have a plan from the mind, that's when we're more susceptible to um, just taking what teachers say and okay, if that worked out for their path, that's going to work out for me. They're where I want to be. They're what I view as success. So I'm going to follow what they did because look at them, they're doing it and they have so much money and they're happy of surrender what it needs to look like when you need to get there, how you need to get there and just have some tools that really ground you, help clear your energy and help you feel connected to your soul and then just let your soul guide you there because you will get there and listening to your soul guidance, that is the ultimate. Yes, it is. Beautiful. I really like asking this question because there's a lot of golden nuggets that come within. For sure. <laughs> and we've mentioned Dark Knight of the Soul several times. Do you have an opinion on Dark Knight of the Soul? Like, do they have to be really dark or, you know, it's probably the same question that I asked in the beginning, but I don't know. I feel like we need to go there again. So, and maybe what it is for you also. Yeah. I, until recently, to be honest, believe that dark nights of the soul were completely necessary until working with my mentor that I'm working with now. And she shared with me, dark nights of the soul are typically when we're trying to come from control and need of, we think things need to look a certain way. We have needs and expectations. And when those aren't fulfilled, we end up into a dark night of the soul because we're kind of apathetic. And then we go deep down into the spiral of the void. So I think usually everyone on a spiritual journey will encounter a dark night of the soul. And it can be an opportunity to just be in that liminal space of okay, let me like look at my life and really reevaluate what's in alignment, what's not in alignment and not having any questions of where am I going? Okay, I release this. Now what's going to happen? What am I going to get? It's like, I release, what am I going to get? Releasing all those expectations of it's just a deep period to go within to release what no longer serves you. But I think that the longer that you're on your spiritual journey, you can kind of prevent yourself from being in that apathetic mode and going into a dark night of the soul, being more conscious and aware of it. Yeah, and feeling your feelings, which is being more conscious, but we oftentimes don't want to feel the feelings. It's not always easy. Like, look at our society of numbing. Yeah. We numb with TV, we numb with food, we numb by working 80 hours a week. It's not easy to feel your feelings. And then we have like the new age of like, you know, that's all in the past, just be in the present moment. That's another way of not yeah. feeling your feelings. So it's really not easy. And that's sometimes where we can go into like a really deep dark night of the soul because we're having like all these feelings and all this stuff coming up but we can make it more digestible and just like, again, take it one step at a time of not like looking at where we want to go, where we're at, feeling like it's such a big bridge to get there. And there's so much healing work to do in all those cycles of knowing, okay, like I'm human. This is a human experience. We're all forever a work in progress. And so how can I be here now with what's coming up? It's just like that little piece of the cake 
what is here now? What can I feel? What can I release? And just allowing your soul to guide you through that. Yeah. When you were speaking, I heard in my mind, cut the noise and focus back, tune into yourself. So it's exactly what you said. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I think I want to ask you one last question uh, about what helped you the most during this challenging time of your life and maybe what did not my spiritual awakenings or my my dark nights of the soul you pick <laughs> what helped me I think what helped me was that I haven't mentioned before is looking yeah. at the support in my life Because I think that we can place a lot of importance around, you know, my family needs to understand me and support me, but they're not on a spiritual journey. So they don't quite understand. And it can be frustrating when you're communicating things and you want them to see you and validate you, but they can't quite. And it doesn't come from a bad place. They're they're just not capable. So finding like-minded souls who are on a spiritual path or they don't even necessarily need to be someone who could just listen and validate you of just say, you know, that sounds really challenging. I'm sorry that you're going through that. How can I support you? Those three things can help you a lot through a dark night of the soul because you have someone just purely listening. You have someone recognizing how you're feeling Because at the end of the day, we all know how to guide ourselves through. Just having people support, understand, validate us is really healing. And then I guess what would not be helpful, again, is placing so much importance of, okay, this is my best friend of 10 years. How come they aren't helping me? How come, you know, my mom doesn't understand? Of we're all in different parts of our journey. And if they're not able to understand and hold space for you, that's okay. You have to make that internal peace with it and really create your own surrounding and inner circle that do. Yeah. And is that how you manifested a new great friend that's aligned and a beautiful friendship? For sure. I needed to release everything that didn't serve me. And I needed to trust that, okay, maybe the people that I, that can't support me right now, it's just for right now. And I wanted to so badly help them to get to where I was because I wanted mm. to keep them in my life. And so I started like telling them about all these spiritual things and all the practices to like help them, help them bring them with me. But that's not how that works. Everyone has their own soul journey. So I really needed to release of, if they're not, a fit right now and it's not fulfilling and I don't feel seen heard and validated then I need to release that and trust that there will be people that do and I also needed to be clear at the type of person I am in relationships and how I show up because I'm very particular and I have a huge heart and I'm very I love to share that that like very mm -hmm. intensely with others and some don't you know some like to just be like very casual friendships and I had to get clear of who I am in relationships how I show up mm -hmm. and how I want others to show up for me I wanted that energetic match in my whole life I never had that energetic match and I always was like you know I'm a really intense person in relationships and I was like I'm actually not I just have a huge heart I really value consistent communication. I value people checking in on me and holding space for me. And these are just basic things in a relationship. Yeah. And I thought like, oh, I'm too much. I'm too much of a friend. I'm too much in relationships. And I realized these are really basic things that I've never received. And so I said, this is what I bring to the table. And this is what I expect in return. I expect a 50-50 relationship. When I had always been 150 yeah. and they've been 
and that exhausted me. And so I didn't make myself wrong or, or label myself. I'd say, no, this is what I bring to the table and it's beautiful. And this is what I want others to bring to the table. When I got really clear on that, especially in the beginning, that's when I started attracting aligned relationships. And there's a lot of people that I've met that I'm like, I don't click with you. And it's been fine because I've been myself from the second that I met them. And I could tell it's just not a match. And that's fine. It's so much more powerful to do it right away than to like go through the drama afterwards of like, I don't feel seen. Why aren't you doing this? And all that kind of stuff. Beautiful. I think that's going to be really inspirational for us to listen to that. Um, And so do you have anything else that you want to share with us? Take your time. Take your time and also look at what you've learned and integrated already because we can sometimes tend to always look ahead. Like, what do I need to learn more of? This is where I need to go. It's always that external, again, that external goal. They're placing so much importance on. But the only thing that we truly have is the present moment. So what have I already learned that I can share with others that maybe I've had more lessons since then? How can I integrate that lesson on a deeper level and show people the layers here? And how can I take my lessons, what I've integrated, what I've embodied, and present that in my own unique way and trust that all these pieces have come together for me to share with others? Because your experiences and your inner wisdom and what you've learned, that is perfect for the souls that you are meant to serve and work with. It's absolutely perfect. So don't doubt it. Go within with what you already have because it's enough. Beautiful. And do you want to share more about what you offer and your services? Sure. So right now I have one-to-one single sessions available. And so that's about bringing one desire forward of what you're working towards. And we do some release and embodiment practices. And then I teach you how to really tap into the quantum because we tap in into different ways. It's unique to each person how to hold that desire to really stay connected with it. Because sometimes we can get really discouraged of like, okay, I took this step, it didn't happen. And then we drop our energy. And so how do we hold that higher energy of your desire? And then I have a mentorship for leaders who are taking action, who are clear on their purpose, but they want to develop deeper layers of their purpose and get really clear of what impact am I here to make? What's my unique method and methodology and um mission to share with others and create that beautiful new world we're talking about and then in the fall I have vibrational medicine coming out and like we've been talking about getting stuck in those healing cycles I need to do more this works on your subtle body so it naturally releases it brings up what's no longer serving you and it helps you integrate and release it see the higher lesson and also come into your embodiment of who you truly are. It really helps you with that confidence and get out of the mind because it's working on your energy of who you really are at the core. And then I'll have some courses to support people in guiding them through that medicine and some other courses in the works as well. Um, So just stay tuned for those. Beautiful. I can't wait to can't wait to eat to ugh, I cannot talk anymore. I cannot wait to hear more about all of these good courses and it sounds amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for this time together. And I will leave your um Instagram and your website on the show notes for anyone who wants to reach out to you. And yeah, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you for everyone listening. So that concludes our episode with Megan. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording the episode. And I also hope, but I know you did because it's my intention always that you got everything that you need 
from this episode and my intention is always to serve you for your highest good and the highest good of all so I really really know that it does help you and I am really trusting that and I want to share that because I know it's important to know and to hear people say that they trust their power and they trust the good that they do and what they offer so that's why I'm voicing it because it can inspire you and it can help you step more into your own power because that's what we need we need leaders showing the way and building that new world we need and want and that is actually also happening it's also being built and it's being built by you by me by all the people that I interview and so many more by the people that step into their role into their leadership and yeah I'm so passionate about that so yeah I will talk to you soon in the meantime keep meditating tuning back within and maybe doing some breath work I love you. Talk to you soon. Bye.